the later we got in this year, the more people on my side of the equation said, listen, I think I'm going to be right, but I can't wait anymore. And when you have a benchmark, you have to sort of you have to sort of hit and you have to go back to your investors or your employees and say, why wasn't I in Apple or NVIDIA and all these things? That's a very difficult conversation to have. So the calendar suggests there's going to be a chase. And to a large extent, that's what we've seen over the last couple of weeks. But I'll also say this. If you look at a lot of the indicators that I look at, forget about the leading economic indicators. That's on the economy side of the thing. Market indicators. We're seeing a the fear greed index at levels on, on the greedy side we haven't seen in quite some time. Welcome to Wealthy on. I'm Eric Chemi. There is so much confusion right now in the markets. We're looking at all time highs on some of these major indices, but a lot of uncertainty about the economy. Where should we go from here? Should we be buying at all time highs? Do you start shorting at such elevated prices and, and fight the momentum? A lot of confusion. My guest today, Guy Adami, I hope you can help me sort this out. I see you everywhere, right? You're on YouTube, you're on television, podcasts, you're on social media. People that follow the markets, they follow finance, they've seen you, they know your wisdom, but I want to I drill a little deeper down on, on, on some of this today. So thanks for joining me on the show today. Well, ICE, as you know, and I coined you that, I don't know if, if you still go by ICE, ICE Chemi, one of my favorite nicknames, but it's a pleasure to be with you. You know, I think the world of you and your family, so thanks for having me. You know, thank, thank you for, for coming on, and I'm glad you toughed out the traffic from Jersey to New York to, to come do this, but it was because of you, I never realized that I, C, and E were in both of my names, first and last names, so <laughs> when I was getting ready for this, I was telling uh, my sister-in-law and and she didn't realize it either. I was explaining, oh, they would call me Ice Ice, and this is why. She's like, I, I never realized that those were the letters in your name, in, in both names. So, so well, you're, you're making a difference. Now. I'm, it, it, better late than never, as they say. <laughs> it's only 10 years later, but we're starting to learn something. So, you know, when, when you see all-time highs mm -hmm. in a world that is uncertain, right? You, you have enough conversations. People think we're going to crash 40% hard landing, there's a recession happening or it's currently happening or going to happen, but yet the stock market, everyone says, it's not the economy, here we are so high. I struggle, right? I struggle because T-bills at 5% yep. seem pretty safe, but after tax, you're not getting much and boom, market moves like 10% in a month, you miss out there. So what are you telling people who are struggling with such extreme moves in such uncertain times? Yeah, again, thanks for having me. And just so I'm so everybody's clear, I've been struggling as well. It has been an extraordinarily difficult environment. This year specifically, you know, I'll tell you, 2022 made a little bit of sense to me. And I was bearish most of the year, and I was bullish twice in 2022. Now, the first time was in June of that year, and basically all predicated on a volatility index, the VIX spiking up to about 34 or so levels that we hadn't seen in quite some time. And my sort of theory with that one was the VIX is suggesting we're in an oversold condition, probably a time for a bounce. And the market did bounce, I think, about 17%. The same thing happened in October of 2022. The VIX spiked to 34 and a half or so. And we basically laid out the same type of trading strategy. What's confused me is everything effectively since. You know, what we've seen here in 2023 has been nothing short of extraordinary in the face of, as you mentioned, some uncertainties that we haven't seen in quite some time. The first thing I look at is bond volatility. I know you just mentioned the bond market, but think about what we've seen. Forget about this year, what we've seen over the last couple of months. We've seen 10-year yields go north of 5% briefly, only to fall back below 4%, seemingly in about a month and a half or two months. Unprecedented move. So bond volatility still off the charts. Yet equity volatility has been, for whatever reason, under control. So the landscape to me suggests that it's just a matter of time before the volatility we're seeing in the bond market, and quite frankly, the currency markets as well, manifests itself into the equity market. And we can talk about some of the headwinds, but you know, my thesis for 2024 is it's going to be extraordinarily difficult for the market to come anywhere close to the performance that we've seen this year, given the backdrop of everything that's going on. And when you talk about that thesis, what are the data points you're looking at? Is this based on experience? Is this a historical, hey, I saw this in the 80s or 90s? Is there something that you're looking at? Because I feel like too many people have a thesis 
but they can't really drill down on, on what detail yeah. numbers they're looking at. So I'll drill down a bit for you. So something called leading economic indicators, LEIs, if people want to go to their Google machine and check it out, they've been now going contracting for the last 19 months. So leading economic indicators are absolutely telling a story. The second story is credit contraction. Bank credit contraction is at levels we haven't seen in quite some time. So the banks are not out there lending money to people. The unemployment rate is sort of the wild card here. I've thought for a while, somewhat correctly, incorrectly last reading, but I think it's going to prove to be the case that unemployment rate is not going to go up in a linear way. It's going to sort of stair step its way to somewhere between 46 and 5%. And I want to say it's going to happen probably in the first half, if not the first quarter of next year. So then you start to connect those dots. An economy where 73% effectively of the economy is driven by people having jobs and buying things and buying things on credit, if the unemployment rate is starting to move higher, if credit is contracting, those are sort of the pillars, those are the foundations of the economy. So if those things start to falter, by definition, the economy should start to falter. On top of which, you know, we're looking at, a, at an environment where the market is expecting somewhere close to 13% earnings growth the math doesn't work with, I think, consensus GDP somewhere south of 2%. So there are just a lot of factors at work here that, in my opinion, to answer your question uh, in a granular way, it's going to be very tough for the market to overlook them and to sort of get through those hurdles. And you're right. There's so many hurdles, right? Because this is the same conversation we've had at home because somebody in my household was thinking very bearish thoughts and got us out of a lot of equities mm -hmm. in May. That yeah. turned out to be the wrong move, but the fundamentals are, are there. Like you said, there's a lot of weak issues. And now we get stuck on the emotion of, we got out, we thought all these things you're thinking, markets moved away from yeah. us. And, and now we're afraid to get back in. I think a lot that, of people are scared. Right. That, that's exactly right. And then, and you sit by each day. So once, it's, a, it's interesting that you say that. So once you've sold something, whatever that something is, let's just say obviously now it's equities, yeah. The clock starts to tick because I'm telling you whether it's Apple or Caterpillar or NVIDIA, once you make a sale every single day, multiple times a day, you go back and look at it. You know where you sold it and you know where it's trading and you're saying to yourself, my God, what have I done? And now you're just hoping that, okay, maybe it'll get back to the level that I sold it at and I can get back in. So the mind starts to work against you without question. I'll tell you and you know this, and I think a lot of people should understand, regardless of what you hear at your cocktail party on Saturday night, regardless of some of the nonsense that you hear from friends and colleagues, nobody buys the lows and nobody sells the highs. So if you sell something, by definition, there's a good chance it's going to continue to go higher. You mentioned it was May. You looked at a lot of things that I'm looking at. I'll just add one more sort of arrow to that quiver. If we make it to February, and we will make it there in terms of the calendar, but if we make it to February with the continued inversion of the twos versus 10-year spread, that will then be the longest inversion since the data has been collected. The length of that inversion suggests, and you go back and look at history, the longer the inversion, the worse the downturn is going to be. So the fact that we haven't seen it yet doesn't mean we won't see it. It's just to me, it's there's an inevitability to all of this. And a lot of people will say, well, the Fed's going to stick the landing. Inflation is going down. Inflation is just going up less quickly. So you look at the cumulative effect of inflation over the last couple of years, it's been devastating for people. And by the way, the Fed indicating their, their pivot or whatever they did a week or so ago, right now the market is pricing in five, if not six, interest rate cuts in 2024. Ask yourself this question. What do you think is going to happen to inflation inputs when the Fed starts cutting rates? Inflation is going to rear its ugly head again. So I'm hard pressed to figure out, and believe me, I spend a lot of time looking at this, how 2024 is going to be even remotely close to what we've seen this year. And so what do you do about those emotions, right? Because yeah. I think that's where the all-time highs really get me, because the facts that you said they're the same. They're all factual. It's right. all factual. I mean, every, ex exactly. You know, everything I just mentioned, it's factually true. 
The problem, of course, is the market, for whatever reason, is looking past all that. So to answer your question, and it's a good question, how do you get over the emotional part of this thing? So this is what I tell people all the time. As human beings, we're emotional animals, right? The great things, you're having a baby, you're at the, you know, things are great, you're feeling good, you're on that sign curve. Things go poorly, maybe your son does poorly in school or something happens, somebody loses a job, and then that sign curve goes. So we sort of ride this roller coaster, this sign curve of emotions. As people, that's what we do. Unfortunately, you do the same thing in the investing world, right? When things are going great, you're up here. When things are going poorly, you're down here. If you sold something and it goes, you know, basically continues to go higher, that despair you feel, that FOMO you feel is real. How do you eliminate that? Well, to be a good, I, and I believe this in my heart, to be a good investor, to be a good trader, somehow you have to take the emotion out of the equation. And one of the best ways to do it is to have a plan going into things. Because if you have a plan and you stick to that plan, almost by definition, you've avoided the emotional part of trading or investing, which I think makes it very difficult for all of us. Here's an example of a plan that didn't work. Mm -hmm. So let's say let's say you get out in May. You know, a lot of people were talking about we're going to go below 4,000 on the yeah. S&P. And, you know, know briefly, we if you look at briefly, we did in October. I mean, you know, within reason. So that that move in October, you started, you're saying to yourself, I was early in May. The fall was sort of backing up. It was it was reinforcing, you know, the belief systems you had in the spring. And then all of a sudden you saw things snap back in a meaningful way. And, you know, I'm hard pressed to understand exactly what the trigger for that was, but obviously it's happened. So there you go. But go so ahead. What, what do you, so what do you say to people? They have a plan but the plan just doesn't shake out, right? right. It's okay, I'm waiting for sub 4,000 to begin to buy back. And now we're looking at 5,000 and, yep, and people could have never, are. never fathomed that. Like you said, how can we have all these problems? The market is just ignoring it. And yet there's this impending doom. Like you said, these two tens curve is just waiting for this impending doom. When the plans break down, what from your experience as a trader going back many years yeah. What do you do at that point if it's just, hey, I guess I just misread this or am I too early, right? Because I think yeah. that's what people can never know. You can be too early for 10 years and you just keep missing gains the whole time. Well, as you know, and I know you know this intuitively, but in our business, if you're early, you're wrong. It's you're just wrong. another word for being wrong. Yeah. So yeah. in a lot of ways, yes. I mean, forget about me being early. I've been wrong in so many different ways this year on a cross of swath of individual names. But most of all, this this resiliency in the broader market. But I think you you have to obviously be critical. You have to be a critical thinker and you have to constantly try to poke holes in your thesis. And I do that and I look at things and I say, what am I looking at? How can I be wrong? And one of the ways you can be wrong is, you know, over time, to your point, that FOMO, that sort of chase for performance starts to kick in. So the later we got in this year, the more people on my side of the equation said, listen, I think I'm going to be right, but I can't wait anymore. And when you have a benchmark, you have to sort of you have to sort of hit and you have to go back to your investors or your employees and say, why wasn't I in Apple or NVIDIA and all these things? That's a very difficult conversation to have. So the calendar suggests there's going to be a chase. And to a large extent, that's what we've seen over the last couple of weeks. But I'll also say this, if you look at a lot of the indicators that I look at, forget about the leading economic indicators, that's on the economy side of the thing, market indicators. We're seeing a the fear greed index at levels on, on the greedy side we haven't seen in quite some time, number one. Relative strength index, which is something everybody sort of talks about and looks at, you know, we're at levels we probably haven't seen in a couple of different years. And in terms of valuations for so many of these stocks that have driven the bus, you know, you're talking about valuations that are, even by their own standards, expensive. So I understand a lot of these stocks are worthy of a premium valuation. But the question you have to ask yourself is, what is that premium and when do they get over their skis? So there are a lot of things to be concerned about. And earlier this week, we saw a pretty big reversal in the market on Wednesday. And you say, well, what was that on the back of? Well, it's on the back of a number of different things. But I can speak intelligently about many things, but I can't in terms of these zero to expiry options. But volatility is a great thing. It works for you until it works against you. And I think 
so many people on the investing side of thing, on the trading side of thing, have gotten themselves on one side of this volatility boat that it's just almost, again, to use the word inevitability, that that's going to snap back. And I think you saw a glimmer of that on Wednesday of this week. And I think that's sort of a snapshot as to what can happen in 2024. You know, these market indicators you mentioned, the greed index, I was just looking at that, right? The, that fear greed that, right. that, that looks like the, the speedometer. And we're way, way, way into greed land. And it, it always ends poorly, right? It mm -hmm. always ends poorly. Relative strength saying something similar. What are some other indicators you're looking at? Just so people who are watching this can go do their own research. What other indicators do you recommend? Yeah, no, you know, it's. I'm glad you mentioned that as well. The When you look under the surface, so one of the things that people are pointing to right now on the positive side of the ledger is this reacceleration or this, I guess, let's put it another way, the market broadening out, right? There are more stocks participating to the upside, and it's not just the names we talk about all the time. The flip side of that coin is, and this is something that I watch very closely, and again, you asked me about my thesis and how I look at things. The IWM is the Russell Small Cap Index. Now, you, I don't know if you can pull up a chart in the show notes, but it is now at levels that we have stalled at a number of different times, and we're nowhere near the all-time high in the Russell that we made a couple years ago. I mention that because, as you know, and I'm sure your listeners and viewers know as well, the small cap stocks are the most economically sensitive names out there. Now, they've bounced recently, I think in large part, due to the fact that they're predominantly, predominantly, in large part made up of small and regional banks. Obviously, there have been a bounce in those stocks. But I look at this and say, all right, how are these stocks going to perform in 2024? Again, under the backdrop of rising unemployment, contracting bank credit, these stocks and so many of these, and you know this as well, I think 65% of the employment in this country is small and medium-sized businesses. So if they start to feel the effect of inflation and contracting credit uh, and growing unemployment, what do you think is going to happen to the underlying economy? So to answer your question, one of the things that I'm laser focused on is the performance of the small caps and on sort of a different level, but something equally important, how is credit performing? And I look at credit through the lens of something called the HYG, the high yield index, which your, your viewers and listeners can look up as well. That is actually traded probably, you know, it makes sense that it's done well over the last couple of weeks as the market has done well. But one of the other concerns I have is a credit event. Now, my concern for a credit event was in this year. It continues to be for next year. But I think a credit event is something that people have to be on the lookout for as well. So much to worry about, right? So, yeah. The, so what should we be optimistic about? I, that's going to be your next question. No, no, it's it's funny. You're you're one step ahead of me. You're early. I was gonna say, I was gonna say, how are you positioned then? Yeah. Right. If we you, you know, okay, 23, I was in your boat. I did not expect it to rise this much. We're still, you and I are waiting for this impending doom to come. But how are you positioned when you got to chase this benchmark and you got investors, yeah. you know, looking over your shoulder, like, why did I miss out? Yeah. Well, a couple of things. Fortunately. I don't have investors or, um, you know, I don't run a hedge fund where I'm, I, I have to answer to people because that's a very difficult conversation to have. So with me personally, it's just, you know, I'm, I'm responsible for myself so I can answer those questions in my head. Right. The flip side of that coin is, as you know, in January, Fast Money would be 17 years old. Now, on a nightly basis, I have to go on air and explain why I've been right about this, wrong about this, wrong about that. Those are very difficult things to do. So again, this being self-aware and constantly sort of being a critical look at your some of the things you've said and some of the ideas you have is paramount. To answer your question, though, I think you have to be, right now, I think I'm saying to myself, all right, I'm preparing for some sort of market event in 2024. And if that event takes place, here's a laundry list of names that I think potentially could be interesting. And some of them are obvious names, but some of them might not be as obvious. So, you know, you look at some of these industrial names, a Caterpillar and a John Deere, which have gone parabolic over the last couple of weeks. And you say to yourself, how is that possible when it's clear that the global economy driven by China is slowing down? 
is there going to be an opportunity to get in those stocks at a much lower level? The home builders have been on a tremendous ride, coinciding, by the way, with 10-year yields going from 5% to below 4%. Is that justified under the environment that I think we're going to have in 2024? And then the small and regional banks. Is there going to be some sort of bank event early in 2024 that are reminiscent of maybe what we saw earlier this year with Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic? So those are some of the things that I'm looking at. The other side of that coin is, why are we seeing all this m a in the energy space? What does Exxon see? What does Chevron see? What does Warren Buffett see buying now 27% of Occidental Petroleum? Like, what's going on there? Why have some of these stocks done well, like a Marathon Petroleum, an MPC, and a Phillips 66 at an all-time high? Why are they outperforming? What's going on in some of these levered names? Are refiners going to reemerge in 2024? So those are the questions that I'm asking myself, but I also write down a list of names and at levels where I think they might be interesting, sort of a wish list in terms of not only stock, but in terms of levels as well. On, on an overall macro basis, are you still 100% equities? Are you sitting in you know 50% cash or treasuries? How are you macro positioned? Is there some shorts in yeah, there? Is no, I mean, you know, the short side of the equation, as you know, it's very difficult to make money on the short side of things. It's it's a very hard game, more so now, obviously, in a world where passive investing has become sort of de rigueur and money flows into stocks regardless. So you have that headwind against you as well. In terms of positioning, yeah, I'm, I'm like you in May, March, April, May, especially after the regional bank thing, I'm like, oh my God, there's there's a shoe to drop here. So I ratcheted a lot of things back and I've been reticent to get back in for all the reasons that you probably have in your head and all the reasons that I've outlined now. But, you know, I'm not going to fall victim to that feel of that fear of missing out and that sort of riding the wave of of this sort of, I don't know, momentum that is sort of driving the market right now. I'm not going to get involved in that game because at some point it's a game of musical chairs. And again, when you saw this earlier this week on Wednesday, you see how quickly things can turn, especially when the system is sort of as one-sided as it currently is. Is there ever the fear that at some point you'll throw in the towel? At some point you may yeah. just decide, you know what? It's never coming back down, mm -hmm. I'm coming in. And that will be the day that that's yeah. the top, right? Yeah. And all of a sudden it drops 20%. You're like, I was right. I should have stuck with my convictions. Do you have experience with that over, you know, in the past where you, where something like that happened, what do they say? The maximum amount of pain yep. is the maximum amount of investors. And, and the market, the market point, can stay, the market can stay sort of crazy longer than you can stay liquid is the old saying, right? So the market can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent is I think the exact terminology. And you're right. Everybody says to themselves, when I, you hear it on CNBC from time to time, I know the top will be in when I do X, you know, when yeah. I get into Apple or when I sort of throw in the towel and say, you know, no moss. But again, the things that I've been concerned about, and it's interesting, earlier this week, President Xi met with President Biden earlier in the month, right? And they came out of that meeting seemingly, I, I want to say the, temper the temperature was taken down a bit. Then earlier this week, we heard and read stories about President Xi basically told President Biden that China will take over Taiwan by any means possible. That's not me paraphrasing. That's the language that you're hearing. So one of the factors, one of the things that I've been terrified of, the sort of the existential risk out there or the black swan event is exactly that. Think about how devastating that would be for multinationals and for the tech sector specifically, if in fact there were hostilities or even some sort of whatever situation reared its ugly head between China and Taiwan. So that to me is something that the market has clearly not priced in what by any way, shape or form. And that can take some of these larger companies like Apple and NVIDIA and some of these names down in a very precipitous fashion. Doesn't sound good. <laughs> well, no, but I'm not trying to be all doom and gloom here. I mean, these are you know, all the things that we're talking about are factually correct. I'm not making right. stuff up. No, he said that. You're right. That was a conversation between you yeah. know, uh, government leaders that was said. So what do we expect is going to happen unless he's just showboating or lying or bluffing, right? Something's going to well, happen. That, you know, and I think we're in a market environment now where in terms of what we're seeing, 
the market pushes. The market's going to push. They're like, you know what? We're going to we're not going to wait for that to happen. We're going to take it right up to, you know, the, the eleventh hour before we pull the trigger because everybody thinks they can time these things. Of course, the problem is they seemingly come out of nowhere. And historically, you know, you see events where where did that come from? And why did the market? You know, why did we see that flash crash? And why did we see moves of that magnitude? And again, it comes out of nowhere. I'll tell you that, you know, right now, I think the market is pricing in, as I mentioned earlier, 12 and a half, 13, 14% EPS growth for 2024. I just don't know how that comes to fruition, given some of the math surrounding it. And when you have a market, again, if you think about what the S&P is built on, it's built on earnings and it's built on the multiple that people attach to those earnings. And that's basically how you get to 4,800 or 4,900 or so in the S&P. So if you start to do the back of the envelope math, I think the market has been expensive. And I think with each passing day that it goes higher, it just gets more expensive. Here's a question. So, you know, a lot of people my age starting to have little kids. They're thinking about that saving for college, right? Like, okay, mm -hmm. I can put money in this 529 plan and I'll start, let's call it, you know, here we are Jan 1st. I'll start putting money in next year because they can put a little bit more starting in January with the new rules. But people worried. I don't want to put money in at the top, right. but I need to start saving now because there's a version as we've gone in the past. If you put money in at the top, you could be 15 years later and still yeah. not have made a dime. Yeah. What, what well, do you tell people? I mean, like it's, that? that's, <laughs> that's a tough one, right? Because here's the math. If, if you buy something and it goes down, let's just say to make it really easy, it goes down 50%. So if you buy something at 10, it goes to five. It has to go up. A hundred percent for you to be, and it's just the math. And you can do that with any numbers you want. So to answer your question, I understand that. There's also the saying, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The next best time is today. So why do I bring that up? Because you got to start somewhere, right? So into the, you know, just sort of the example that you gave me in terms of 529, that's something where you have to say to yourself, okay, I don't really care what's going on in the world. On January 2nd of 2024, knowing that I have three young kids and knowing what the price of college is going to be, I don't really care. I'm going to start understanding that my entry point might be within 5 10% of a high. I don't care because I'm doing this over the course of the next 14, 15 or so years. And that has to be the mindset. But in addition to that mindset, you can't be a person that then looks every single day at the underlying holdings of that 529 plan, because you're going to make yourself insane. Yeah. And that's why I think a lot of people are going insane right now because they're, they're paralyzed at yeah. this, this disconnect between markets and reality that you know we're facing here. Does this remind you of a time in your trading career? Does this, is there a specific year incident, a geopolitical yeah. situation that you're like, this is the best analog for what's happening today. Or is this There's all so, you, it's, you know, it's a great, there are a lot of people, and, and I want to be crystal clear. I'm not suggesting we're on the precipice of anything I'm about to <clears throat> give you parallels to. But if you go and just look, a lot of people are making the parallels of the late 1920s. The market was on fire in the late 1920s under the backdrop of very similar things that we're seeing now. Inverted yield curve, all these like economic indicators that I pointed out, but the market was seemingly going up every day until it wasn't. You can make parallels, I guess, in the late 1940s. The one that comes to mind for me, and people will push back, is the early 1970s, specifically 72 and 73, when inflation was rearing its ugly head. The Fed was trying to fight it. They basically said mission accomplished, only to have inflation come raging back in 73, 74. That to me is why <clears throat> I'm surprised that this Federal Reserve is seemingly saying mission accomplished because they saw what happened 50 or so years ago. And I'm telling you that the inputs of inflation uh, are going to start to, I think, reaccelerate into next year. And again, inflation isn't going lower. It's just going up less quickly, which is I'm not trying to be glib or it's just that's just the math. No, I, I agree with you. I'm often confused when people talk about, oh, inflation's come around. It's like, no, no, no. Everything is 25% more expensive yeah. than it was two or three years ago. And it'll be 30 or 35% more, more expensive. It's not getting cheaper. It continues to get more right. expensive. 
at whatever rate you want, but nothing's ever getting cheaper. We're never getting those price levels ever again. That's gone. And that's why that's why for a lot of people, they get so frustrated when they're watching TV and they're hearing that in full, we're, we're, we've killed inflation, inflate, and they're saying, what are you talking about? I know what my health care is. I know what education. I know what just buying groceries are. What world are you living in? And, and I'll say this, and this is not to be hyperbolic at all. I mean, the numbers bear this out. We talk about, are we going into a recession? I have no, I'm not an economist. I say this all the time. I'm not smart enough. I'm not humorless enough to be an economist. But this is what I do know. For 45, 50 million people in this country, and that represents somewhere between 12 and 18% of the population, they wish we we're in a recession. Because for a lot of these people, it is late 1920s, 1930s in terms of what they're dealing with and the decisions they have to make. I think one in six people are relying on some sort of support. They don't call them food stamps anymore. It's called something else. You know, a lot of people are dealing with things we haven't had to deal with in quite some time. So they'd wish it was a recessionary environment because for them it's worse. And the disconnect, and you started this earlier by saying there's always a disconnect between the market and the economy. I kn Believe me, I know that as well as anybody. The problem I have here is that chasm, that disconnect is at levels we haven't seen in quite some time. The stock market is saying one thing and the real economy is saying something entirely different. It's 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 certainly certainly weird. Is there is there a war story, you know, that, that you go back to in your own experience, a, a, tr a big mistake that you made where you think I saw something like this. I, I really struggled with with how to yeah. maneuver through it, manage it, and I would do something different now. Well, the war stories, so as I mentioned earlier, Fast Money started in, and they're, they're career stories, but this I think is more relevant to the people listening and watching. So Fast Money started in January of 2007. Obviously, the world changed you know, in a dramatic fashion over the next few years. And I don't say, I'm, I don't want to say we saw things coming, but you know, we were talking about things that we were seeing and a lot of the feedback we got from people is nobody warned us. Nobody told us, you know, where were all you experts in 08 and 09? And that haunts me to this day. So the scars from that are still manifesting themselves today. So in terms of being cautious, I'm probably overly cautious and maybe a bit hyperbolic because I don't want to make the same mistakes a lot of people made back then with saying everything's OK. There's nothing to worry about here when clearly there were things to be worried about only in retrospect you know people saw those things so i'm trying to be ahead of that curve and maybe by trying to be ahead of that curve i'm way too cautious or dire but i'd tell you something i can sleep well at night knowing that i've been pointing out some of the things that we've talked about over the last half hour or so and if people choose not to listen i mean that's fine and by the way not listening for the last 6 months has been the exact right thing to do obviously through the lens of the market but again in my opinion, Eric, there's sort of an inevitability to all the things that we've been talking about. It's just a matter of when. I think we all thought it would be 23. So now I did. we think, okay, it'll be 24. And I, I hope we're not having this conversation a year from now saying, okay, it'll happen in 25 and we're yeah. still waiting again. Well, then, and we'll have a, and listen, I'm more than happy to come back wrong, right, whatever, you know, six months from now and take a sort of a look back in the conversation we had today and the conversation maybe we'll have in June or July of next year. But I'll say this, you know, the things that we're talking about, they don't turn on a dime. Like all the things that we're looking at, these are long cycle things. And again, I'll go back to the yield curve inversion, which historically has been a great indicator of impending whatever. And as I said earlier, if we get to January, which is now a month and a half, two months away, and we're still inverted to any degree, it'll be the longest inversion since we started looking at the data, right? And as I said earlier, the longer the inversion and go back and look, typically the more severe the downturn. And people will say it's different this time. I don't, I'm hard pressed to understand why it's different this time. That, that was my question for you is, is there anything that could be different or do you hear the case from the bulls and you just shake your head and say, no, this, this just doesn't make sense. What, what do you, what do you think is that they're picking up on that? Well, that I think that's with? a great question. I think what, I think the bullish thesis is, you know, look at what we've weathered. Um, you know, we've gotten through 500, whatever basis points of fed rate 
hikes seemingly unscathed. We're about to go to an environment where the Fed is going to start to cut. Historically, low rates have been equal to doing well in terms of stock market performance. It's a very one-dimensional way of looking at things. But with that said, if you own something at five and it goes to 10, the reasons it went to 10, nobody really cares, right? All you know is something doubled. The reasons should matter, but the reasons don't matter. So if you've done well in the market, all you look at it is through the lens, I've done really well. But now's the time to start to take a critical look at, okay, the market's done really well. Why is it happening? And what could be sort of the hurdles, the obstacles that we're not talking about, we're not taking into consideration. So the bull case is we continue sort of this passive investing, money flows, China's losses are gains. The United States deserves a higher valuation because we're the best street on the block type of thing. Yeah. I mean, I guess I can sort of understand that. I just don't think that's what's going to happen. So before we go then, what's your one main piece of advice for people who are watching? They're in your yeah, boat. Yeah, I love sure that. So here it is. Here's my one. And, and hopefully, and you might have to think about this a couple of times, folks, but here you go. Listen to everybody, but don't listen to anybody. And what does that mean, Eric? I'll tell you what it means. It means you take in every piece of information you possibly can. You read whatever you can. You listen to two, whatever podcast. You take all that information in, and then you make your own decisions, right, based on everything you've heard. So it's got to be your decision at the end of the day. You can say, I heard what Guy said. I heard what Eric said. I vehemently disagree with them. I listen to them, but I'm not listening to them, right? So take in everything. So many people are guilty of their investment thesis is whatever they heard last, right? That's you, that's like going to a craps table. You might catch a hot craps table, but over time, the house is going to win. So listen to everybody, but do your own work and make your own decisions based on all that work and based on all those inputs. That's good. So yeah, if you didn't like what you heard for the last half hour, scrap it, or at least understand. I think well, a lot uh, of no, people- No, 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 don't scrap it. I mean, take it and listen to it and then say, okay, I understand what Eric and Guy just talked about for the last 45 minutes. I just don't agree with it. And these are the reasons I think they can be wrong. And my, you know, my, my investment thesis is going to be based on all the things they just talked about, but the reasons why those things are not going to come to fruition. So that, that's what I mean by listening to everybody. But then at the end of the day, you got to make your own decisions. You you explained it better. I, I was too glib, but I, I think there's a lot of people, especially with social media, you know, they get into the comments and it's like, oh, I'm I'm logging off. I don't like what they're saying. But I think it's important. You got to hear those different perspectives. You got to mm -hmm. understand what the market consensus is, because the market consensus Half the people are buying because people are selling to them, right? So every every transaction That's is right. two sides of it. So you got to understand both sides so that you can make your you can make your decision. You can't just listen to people that you always agree with because at some point they're going to be wrong at some point. Well, that's true in everything in life, right? You I, and I think you know before we get out of here, we get caught up in our echo chamber. And listen, I might be guilty of it as well. You know, sometimes I go out searching for stories that are going to sort of back up and galvanize what I think, but I also then try really hard to listen to, read about things that, okay, guy, these are the reasons you're wrong. But it's so easy to sort of live in that echo chamber, whether it's politics, whatever the hell, you, sports, you got to get out of your echo chamber and, and you can't get caught up in your dogma, whatever that dogma is. And Guy, thank you so much. Really appreciate this. I know you got to go. Busy day. Before you go real fast, where can people find you? Where? Give me the social media so Check handles. us out on yeah. YouTube at Risk Reversal Media. We have a YouTube channel. We have a daily show called Market Call, 1 o'clock Eastern Time. We also have a podcast that drops on Friday called On the Tape. And Dan Nathan does a podcast called OK Computer, which typically drops on Wednesdays. But you can find everything at the Risk Reversal website, riskreversal.com. Thank you, Eric. Appreciate it, Guy. Thank you so much. Thanks again to my guest, Guy Adami, for joining me here on the show. And thanks to all of you for watching and listening, checking out this podcast. Of course, if you like it, please actually like it on the channels, share it, subscribe. All of those things really help get that content out to as many people as possible. And of course, if you're hearing all this and you're wondering, what am I going to do about my finances, my family's investment future? You can go online to wealthyon.com. You can fill out a very short form there. We can connect you with investment advisors, investment professionals that we endorse specifically, that, that we know, we vetted. They're not just anybody off the street. These are people that we have relationships with and that we think they could be a good fit for you. So there's, there's no obligation. There's no commitment. There's no cost. You can just have a, a consultation with them. You can just talk to them about what you're thinking about 
If you like them, great. If you don't, that's fine too. It's a free public service that we provide here at Wealthion. We're trying to help as many people as possible with that. So you can see that at Wealthion.com. Also on Wealthion.com, Wealthion.com slash Ask Anthony. You can submit your questions for the Anthony Scaramucci show. Speak up with Anthony Scaramucci. He's taking live calls. He's taking your questions online. That show airs every Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern, Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern again. And uh, wealthion.com slash askanthony is your opportunity to get your questions in on that. Once again, thank you so much for watching and listening. I'm Eric Chummy. We'll see you next time.